There's been very little discussion in the current by-elections of European issues, although there are a lot of European topics that might, might be discussed. We learn, for instance, that uh, British firms are having to pay seven and a half billion pounds a year in formalities uh, for, bring, for filling out forms for imports and exports. Uh, we were told that form filling was something that will be reduced by Brexit. Uh, we might talk about the difficulty that musicians are having in touring abroad uh, to the European Union. You remember that um, there were some prominent musicians who thought that it would be just as easy to tour abroad after Brexit as it was before. We might talk about the daily news of jobs uh, and resources um, being transferred to continental Europe from the city of London. We might talk about the difficulties that uh, Britain had, United Kingdom had, in coming to any worthwhile trade agreement with Australia thus proving that it's more difficult to negotiate with third parties outside the European Union um, than within, from within the European Union. Uh, but these have not been the topics uh, which the major parties have wanted to talk about during the by-elections. Uh, occasionally, they've talked about some specific aspect of Brexit, uh, but the major parties have been unwilling, very unwilling indeed, to bring out the point that the problems that arise from Brexit are not problems of implement implementation, but they are the problems which are inherent in Brexit itself. Uh, this reluctance, uh, I think, uh, doesn't stem uh, from any concern, particularly with the national interest, but rather with the internal political interests or perceived political interests of particularly the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats. The Labour Party is a, a party in a, a state of shock still from its loss of its Scottish seats um, through the rise of the SNP. Uh, the Labour Party knew that um, one of its electoral and governmental props was the MPs that it was able to get elected in Scotland. With their disappearance, the, the viability of the Labour Party as a party of government is much reduced. The fear is now uh, that something similar will be happening in the so-called Red Wall in the traditional um, working class pro-labor constituencies of the North of England. Uh, and, and that has uh, led the Labour Party to what I think are, are some irrational decisions. Uh, in particular, um, the urge by people like Ed Miliband to embrace Brexit. Um, Andy Burnham was another one saying that this is what, um, the be what we should be doing. Uh, Emily Thornberry went so far as to say, we're never going to rejoin the European Union. Uh, this is part, uh, I think, of, of a, a wider uh, attempt by the Labour Party to present itself as being in sympathy and in touch uh, with ordinary working class patriotic people. Um, a, uh, an attitude and a position that Boris Johnson, rich um, metropolitan elitist that he is, um, has claimed for himself. Um, Brexit is part of a, an attempt to reposition the Labour Party as the party of, of a certain kind of patriotism. Uh, the danger about this uh, opportunism is that you may end up, the Labour Party may end up offending everybody and pleasing nobody. Uh, the liberal metropolitan Remainers uh, will rightly think that their views should be taken into account in formulating Labour policy. Uh, they don't like being told there's nowhere else for them to go. Um, and the people in the Red Wall will be rightly um, patronized and resentful of the stereotype that presents them as unreflective, sun-reading nationalists um, who need to be th thrown um, the odd um, um, sliver of red meat um, to keep them on side with the Labour Party. Uh, I don't think that this is a tactic that's going to work, and Chesham and Amersham showed uh, that you can end up, the Labour Party can end up offending everybody. Uh, the Labour Party lost its deposit in Chesham and Amersham, uh, and a major party, even in a by-election like that, um, should never suffer that fate. The Liberal Democrats um, are in a slightly different position. They've always been a, a, a party of opposition, um, so it's always been tempting for them um, to avoid specific policy commitments uh, in order to appeal to the maximum number of disgruntled um, uh, and resentful uh, voters uh, who wanted to make a statement against the government of the day or the opposition of, of the day. Um, to be fair to them, um, the Liberal Democrats um, do have as a long-term goal rejoining the European Union. But uh, Ed Davies said earlier this year, 
that uh, the Liberal Democrats are, are not a rejoined party, uh, and their candidate in, in Chesham and Amersham um, said that rejoining was not a, a priority. Um, the Liberal Democrats are, are rather in the position of St. Augustine, um, oh Lord, make me a, a rejoiner, but not yet. Uh, I don't think that's a position which it's going to be possible to sustain indefinitely. But it shouldn't be the case that opposition to Brexit depends entirely on calculations of uh, electoral and party interest. Uh, the damage that's being done by, to this country by Brexit goes much further than that. Uh, it was a, a project which was supposed to secure our boundaries, secure our frontiers. It may well end up with those frontiers being redrawn uh, to the diminution of, of the United Kingdom. Um, most importantly, Brexit has injected a, a, a culture of, of of fantasy and lies into to our whole uh, political governance. Uh, and a very good example of that is the sad episode, the, the lamentable episode uh, of, of, of Mr. Hancock, um, the Secretary of State for Health, uh, who recently um, was found to have broken his own guidelines, his own regulations on social distancing. Now, this was embarrassing for him uh, and in a well-run country, it should have led to his immediate resignation and or dismissal. Neither of those things happened. He hoped he was going to be able to ride out the storm and the prime minister specifically backed him, uh, accepting his apology uh, as if the prime minister were the possibly injured party um, and saying that the matter was closed. It, it was only when there was a revolt on the conservative back benches from people who have never liked um, at Hancock, um, that the Prime Minister changed his mind uh, and Hancock was allowed to resign, uh, receiving in return a, a fulsome commendation from uh, Johnson um, of the work that he had done. And then a couple of days later, uh, Boris Johnson was claiming um, to the newspapers, to the people at uh, the by-election where he was visiting, that in Spen, um, that he had uh, sacked um, Hancock for his behavior. Uh, this um, cavalier attitude towards the truth, this uh, contempt with which people are treated uh, as if they have no memory from one day to the other of, of what Johnson said on Friday, um, is a, a, a very definite um, legacy um, of Brexit. Um, truth and coherence are sacrificed to the overarching need to be to show uh, that Brexit in some way is working and, and that has effects throughout our, our, our political governance. Uh, there are people in both the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats who are conscious of the need to talk more, more, more thoughtfully and, and more sensibly about Brexit. Um, but they're very re reluctant usually to go to, so far as to say that the United Kingdom should rejoin the European Union. Uh, the approach is much more uh, that it's too early to talk um, about rejoining the European Union. Perhaps in five years' time we can think about the customs union or, or join, rejoining the internal market. Well, the doctrine of unripe time has always been a, a disastrous one uh, for European issues as far as the United Kingdom's concerned. It, it, it's always too early and, until it's too late. And it was too late when we, when we, we got round to, to, to the referendum. Uh, politically, they're, they're, it's a very difficult case to make to say that the United Kingdom should join the customs union or the, or the internal market without being a full member of the European Union. Uh, it will give colour to the claim um, that the United Kingdom was being ruled from Brussels with no say in the decisions that were taken in Brussels. Uh, we would neither be having our cake nor eating it. Eating it. Uh, if there is a case for the sovereignty sharing implicit in the customs union and the single market, then that case should be made by British politicians. And the logical conclusion of that case is that we should join the European Union. Uh, as full members. Uh, why on earth would we wish to rejoin the European Union you know, on less favourable terms than those we enjoyed uh, as members? That would be the worst of all worlds. Um, and, and I think it's a, a seductive idea that that halfway house will be attractive. Uh, but I don't think that when you look at it in detail, it, it can be made attractive to the British electorate. Uh, obviously, the future relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union will depend very much on what happens um, in the next general election. The uh, events, the, the result of Chesham and Amersham, show that uh, the electorate is capable of self-mobilization, even without a formal electoral pact. It, it may well be that when the next election comes along, 
2023 or 2024, um, the electorate will be capable of working out how to vote in the most efficient manner possible to ensure that there isn't a conservative government. Uh, I think it will be easier for them to do that this time than it was in 2019 when uh, fear and resentment of Mr Corbyn uh, was, a, was a disturbing factor in, in, in many calculations. If a non-conservative government does come to power to succeed this conservative government, um, then it will have a much better chance of taking a, a, a rational and considered view of the United Kingdom's future relationship with the European Union if over the coming three or four years, um, the political elite have spent time talking about this issue rather than simply evading it or, or nitpicking about aspects of Brexit rather than recognizing that it's Brexit it, itself which is, is, is the problem. Um, when we have, if we have a, a non-conservative government, uh, I hope that it will have as one of its components uh, a party committed to rejoining the European Union uh, because I, I think that there is a, a rich well uh, uh, of electoral advantage to be tapped um, by the first party that um, unambiguously and uh, formally says uh, that the United Kingdom should rejoin the European Union, not merely um, come a little closer or be less hostile or, or change this or that aspect of Brexit. Uh, the more logical and coherent position uh, is that the United Kingdom should rejoin the European Union. And it's only the dysfunctionality of our present political system um, that makes it difficult for major parties to say that. Uh, the first major party which does say that um, will have rendered itself and, and the country uh, an enormous service and it will be a service that history will recall with unstinting admiration.